Welcome to Reclamation's History Webinar Series, Grand Coulee Dam. This is the 12th and last of a monthly series as we build towards Reclamation's 120th anniversary on June 17th, 2022. The event is being recorded. If you're not interested, please disconnect at this time. If you're having technical issues, please disconnect and join again. Additionally, you may have better success connecting to the team app on your computer and not in the web browser. If you have any questions, please click on the comment, the question bubble in the upper right hand corner. We will do our best to answer questions at the end. At this time, I would like to introduce Reclamation Senior Historian, Dr. Andrew Gahan. Andrew. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for joining us today. During the 1930s, boosters proclaimed the construction of Grand Coulee Dam as, quote, the biggest thing on earth, end quote. When the dam was completed in 1942, the almost mile long, 550 foot high structure containing about 12 million cubic yards of concrete certainly appeared to prove its admirers correct. But of course, Grand Coulee Dam is much more than steel, cement, and transmission lines. It is etched in the memory of all who built it as both an exciting adventure and a personal achievement. For the Bureau of Reclamation, Grand Coulee was to stand as a monument to the federal government's commitment to develop water resources in the American West. And as such, efforts were made to enhance the dam and highlight its distinctiveness. However, few can dismiss the impact that the biggest thing on earth had on the indigenous peoples whose lives have been deeply affected by the construction of Grand Coulee Dam. We are excited to have with us three presenters who will provide unique and diverse insights into the history of one of Reclamation's showcase facilities. To begin, I am pleased to introduce Ivan Snavely, training technician at Grand Coulee Dam. A veteran of the U.S. Navy, Ivan worked for the Department of Veteran Affairs before coming to Reclamation, where he managed the Grand Coulee Dam Visitor Center. Ivan will introduce us to the observations of Hugh Blanc, a longtime newspaper reporter who covered dam construction and developed a personal relationship with Grand Coulee Dam, and especially the lives of those who built it. Ivan? Good morning, my name is Ivan Snavely, as Andrew stated, and I work in the training department here at Grand Coulee Dam, and I'm pleased to be here today to share a little bit about the book, Behind the Byline, Hugh of Feisty Newsman's Memoirs. And what we're gonna be talking about is that early history of Grand Coulee Dam, when Hugh first, graduated college and made it to Grand Coulee as a reporter from in the 1930s. He was born in 1909 in a little town, uh, his family in Holland. The farm was located by a canal, immigrated to the U.S., set, eventually settle, settling in Auburn, Washington, just south of Seattle. He graduated high school and joined and enrolled in the in the uh, in the uh, in journalism at the University of Washington. He graduated while delivering the Seattle Post Intelligencer as a delivery boy. He uh, got a call from the university. Hey, they need a reporter at the Grand Coulee Dam. Who remembered thinking, where's the Grand Coulee Dam? And as you can see from this picture, there was no dam yet. The first shovel of earth hasn't hadn't been turned yet. And this is a fine picture of Seton's Ferry, just about where the dam is today. About the only way for miles you could take this cable ferry across to get across the uh, river to the other side. Someone gave him an old pair of boots so he'd look somewhat normal around all the construction people and headed for Almira, where he rented the cheapest room available at the Almira Hotel 
The building, as you see, still stands today, and he'd order the cheapest breakfast, coffee, and cinnamon toast. Remember, everybody was broke. There wasn't any extra money, so getting the cheapest uh, room available was important. Then he'd have to wait and hope for a ride to hitchhike to the Grand Coulee Dam project. This is a good picture of uh, a little bit later than what we're talking about with Grand Coulee. They already started building the, uh, working on the dam. To get to the dam first though, Almira is about 10 miles or so south of the top of the Coulee wall you see in this picture. He had to come get down that Coulee wall just to get to the dam site. And that really was not an easy task. As you can see from this photo, in number 10, the road was even today is quite, quite uh, windy. But remember when he had to take this road down, it wasn't paved, probably no guardrails, muddy and icy in the summer and dusty and bumpy excuse me, muddy and icy in the winter and dusty and bumpy in the summer. On his trip down that hill though, he remembered seeing a B Street, which is in Grand Coulee today, that was buildingless and buildings starting to pop up. Hugh considered his job important. The workers that were contract, the workers that worked on one side of the river really didn't know what was going on on the other side of the river. He considered his job very important. The workers, the workers didn't know what was going on unless they read his articles in the newspaper. You know, word spread fast. The country was broke. People needed jobs and people wanted to work. One problem is there was no houses in Grand Coulee. First house Hugh rented was 12 by 12 foot, small, no running water, an outhouse dug about 35 feet from his little 12 by 12 cubicle. He remembers times he tells and has stories in this and in this book about the times he'd wake up and the water had froze across the top. One solution was a gentleman brought about 30 small houses like you see pictured here that were used in the Rock Island uh, Dam project over by Wenatchee. Those cabins were very small too. This is a very good story. One building, maybe two or three on B Street. And there's a wonderful story Hugh talks about a couple that had a baby. This gentleman dug a hole in the side of the earth, put up a gunny, a gunny sack, some type of a barrel heater, whatever that means. And that was their house for the winter. There was another story about a couple that used one of the tin crates used to ship pianos to the tin uh, different saloons and bars that were eventually being built on B Street. Everyone was broke. Everybody wanted a piece of the pie at the Grand Coulee uh, area. Eventually, Hugh married Martha. And he bought his first house in Electric City. And if you take a look, the far side of that little puddle there eventually would turn out to be Banks Lake today, is the Electric City of those days. He said for, and he got a plot of land and the house for about $650. He writes in his book, you'd think it was probably just a shack with the price that we spent, but it actually was pretty nice. They enjoyed living there. They even won a home and garden contest for their yard. This is a wonderful picture of North Dam that uh, you can walk across current today. But in this picture, you'll see it's only partially built. And if you walk from the, one, uh, the Highway 155 side in the park all the way to this big rock you see next to the canal, that feeder canal that has yet to be used, 
Visitor Center maintains a geocache that can provide you some good information and a fun game on today's Columbia Basin Irrigation Project. The announcement of the Grand Coulee Dam project ended up with worldwide distribution. Here's the front page that was spread around the world by the Wenatchee Daily World. Hugh's very first article on the front page of any, uh, any newspaper and ended up being on front pages all over the world. Notice the propaganda, two million wild horses, a pencil drawn dam with the horses shadowed running along, building the greatest development project in the world. But before you could even start the project, you had, had to dig a hole. And that was some of the next headlines that spread into the newspapers around New York on the eastern side. Man digging the largest hole ever dug, on, uh, the largest hole on earth ever dug by man. And you can see them just now starting to dig that hole, taking out the rocks, the boulders, the silt that settled here from years of the Columbia running through it. Of the there was one young chap that came one of the first two, one of the first winters to B Street. This is a picture of today's current B Street. If you take a look at the end where B Street kind of goes up a hill, that's the entrance to B Street today from Highway 174. But it wasn't paved. It was muddy in the winter and icy and dry and dusty in the, in the summer. This gentleman sat in one of the offices on B Street to keep warm until he could hear those truck drivers full of lumber trying to get up and over to that, slipping in the mud, slipping in the ice, trying over and over. And when this gentleman figured out, oh, they must be frustrated enough, he'd head over there. He brought a tractor to Grand Coulee. He'd head over there with the tractor and offer to pull their truck on in, onto B Street for a cost of $5. He watched, uh, he watched B Street from the very beginning. He was one of the very, very early visitors. He writes in his book that B Street reminded him with the false fronts, the wood sidewalks, the muddy and icy streets to the dry and dusty of the old Western movie sets in Hollywood. Workers at the dam earned about $20 a week. If they had some overtime, they could get about $25 a week. First, they had to pay for their rent. Then they'd go to the grocery store so they could buy their groceries and, essence and essentials. And whatever was left over, they used for entertainment. One group of workers in, uh, in at uh, the Grand Coulee Dam would use their uh, what money they had left over at one of the two theaters, the Roosevelt and the Grand Coulee. The Grand Coulees always had, as pictured here, now called the Grand Theater, but not even used as a theater, um, had a, 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 a doubleheader matinee on Fridays. Hugh says that first movie on Fridays was a very poor quality movie and, and the workers visiting for the entertainment didn't really worry. It was the second event on that double matinee called Bank Night. Everybody coming in, signed a register, put a little bit of money in a pot. The pot would grow. You had to be present to win. If your name was drawn, you got to win the pot for the night. If nobody won, they'd put that pot and save it for the next week and add more money. Again, you had to be present to win. When the pot would get up to $800 to $1,000, now imagine earning $20 a week, putting in a nickel or so to win a pot of $1,000. It caused quite an excitement. This small theater you see pre uh, presented here could hold up to 800 to 1300. There's not nearly that many seats, so it was elbow to elbow. 
It got so busy, people would crowd out in front of the theater, getting wanting that chance to win that thousand dollars, where the police had to close off that street because of all of the people. Just imagine that. A twenty dollar weekly salary and winning winning a thousand dollars. You it would have felt like you won the lotto. Why do I like this book? Because even today I can go to B Street and experience a little bit about B Street by reading this sign. B Street, the street that never slept, dance halls, boardwalks, taxi drivers, muddy streets, gambling, dance music, ladies of the evening, bright lights, boxing, bars, construction stiffs, and no empty parking spaces, even at four o'clock in the morning. Today, after reading this book, and roaming through Grand Coulee, I can still visit and see a couple of those buildings that were built them days with those front false walls. I can visit the TP drive-in that's currently across the street from the City Hall in Grand Coulee and Safeway. This is where if you had a nickel, and you worked all day, you were dirty and sweaty. You gave them a nickel, they gave you a bar of soap and a clean towel. You could go down in the basement of this exact building and get a hot shower. You could go on down to Cooley Dam just below the, excuse me, the old engineer's town in Cooley Dam across the street or down just below the dam and mired the stones and read about some of the stories of the CCC workers that were used to put these stones in place and they're still there today. You can read about stories about the train tunnel that was, uh, you, that was built but never used. You can continue farther past the tunnel and see this trail that's not marked, that can go up to a view that you can only see that you, by walking, you can't drive up to. Also, if you look in the right picture, you see that wood slough? They found there was a there was a spring that still works today that still spews water, and they still use that same uh, slough to move the water away from flowing into the buildings in the city hall uh, toward the train tunnel. If you explore behind the Nathaniel, what behind and past the Nathaniel Nat Washington power plant. You can see some little foundations on the road. You can read about, this used to be the recreation center, and you can read about how Red Cross volunteers teach the area residents how to swim. You could also, for $3.50, climb aboard one of those seaplanes and get an up in the air experience of, of the project. You can see some of the, i uh, talked about that, or you can visit the high school, or excuse me, you can see some of the foundations that still exist of some of the uh, construction teams, uh, houses they lived in that had to be removed to, be, to make way for the Nat Washington power plant. You can visit the high school on a very cold day, it had to have been, where they would change the football field into an ice rink for a family event. You can read some stories about Nat Wash Nathan Nathaniel Nat Washington, who the third power plant is now named after. Here you see him sitting in a car campaigning for prosecuting attorney of Grant County. And you can go to the Grand Coulee Dam Visitor Center. Got movies upstairs, a wonderful project movie, lots of displays, and the best place to view the laser light show every night through the summer is right here in the concrete bleachers at the Grand Coulee Dam Visitor Center. I hope you get to read this book. You can find it on Abe's book. Get the viewpoints of uh, Hugh Blanc. Go to some of these sites I showed you and get a little bit more fill. Hey, that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed. Back to you, Andrew.
Uh, Dr. Gahan, you're muted there. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank, thanks again, Ivan. I, we really appreciated your presentation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. George Hadamil, historian at the Grand Coulee Power Office. George is relatively new to reclamation, arriving at Grand Coulee in September 2021. Yet, Dr. Hadamil has a wealth of experience on vernacular industrial architecture, cultural landscape studies, and contemporary heritage practices. George received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh in cultural geography and taught design innovations at the Glasgow's, Glasgow School of Art. He is a graduate of Cornell University's architecture program and Columbia University's historic preservation master's program. Among his many duties at Grand Coulee, George is currently working on the National Register nomination for Grand Coulee Dam. And will we and will be speaking to us today about the history of the dam's terrazzo from design and installation to contemporary engagement. George. Thank you very much, Dr. Gahan, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to share a little bit of uh, maybe a bit of unknown history about the dam itself. And uh, hopefully you can all see a uh, my uh, screen of the first slide and uh, so uh, hopefully we can just take it away here we go walking down on the streets of hollywood and vine you'll notice a little bit of of black and pink stars all up and down the the hollywood walk of fame these dark uh, black, almost gray colored uh, forms, as well as the pink stars and brass edges are created as to what's called by uh, the form called terrazzo, a unique and very special type of building style and form and flooring that was used uh, from the early Renaissance all the way to today. Its connection to Cooley is incredibly uh, special as not only one of the largest installations of terrazzo anywhere in the United States back in the day, but also in its ways that it was used throughout the facility. The talk today will explore a little bit about what terrazzo is, its history at Cooley and its application, and its current opportunities in conservation and rehabilitation that we are hopefully going to, to explore further. A little bit first about where it came from. The origins of terrazzo means terrace or la terrazza in Italian, and it comes from Venetian tradesmen and tradespeople who were working and creating uh, large sculptures as well as installing large sections of flooring in the aspects of Doge's palace across Venice and various other uh, palazzi across the Venetian lagoon. The remnant pieces of marble and, as, and other components were left behind, and these pieces were what would, would, what would be called the original sustainability or the original reuse of remnant uh, uh, pieces. Those pieces would be embedded into the floors, uh, into some type of matrix, and then be ground by hand uh, until it was level and polished and then sealed to create a unique flooring system that was both durable, beautiful, as well as much cheaper than having to cut the marble uh, pieces from the Carrara across the, the Apennines. The actual formula, the actual creation of, of terrazzo itself is mainly made from the aggregate or the combination of pieces of marble particularly, but also can be today conformed of glass or other forms of composite. It can be added to a, some type of binder, usually and historically some type of clay or lime, but today a Portland cement or an epoxy and then some type of sealer. And lo and behold, the sealer was originally goat's milk, but today could also be linseed oil and again, some type of epoxy. And with all of those three components, we create a, a type of a unique uniform floor finish that is bonded and incredibly strong to the, to the surface of the floor. 
the type of fluorine that you see on the left is a, as a type of terrazzo called palladiana or palladian terrazzo, which is made from larger pieces of, of marble uh, remnants. The, the, the layering of this, of this terrazzo system is, is fairly straightforward and simple. That creates some type of base where there is some then an under layer of sand or cement with the actual terrazzo mix at the top made from those pieces of aggregate and, and uh, other matrixes. There's also an element of divider strips, usually metal, zinc, brass, um, uh, sometimes even aluminum, to be able to create not only divisions of shapes and forms, but also provide uh, expansion joints across the area of the terrazzo itself. This allows us to create not only a uniform surface, but also to give us the variety that Terrazzo is incredibly well known for, as well as the different colors that come from the different uh, forms and aggregates that are created with that space. Historically, that is Italian uh, makers and tradespeople uh, slowly immigrated to the United States, and it was introduced in the 1700s and did not take on until the late 19th century, uh, being used at various uh, wealthy and well-to-do establishments as Although it was incredibly reusing of, of material, the actual application of it was incredibly uh, time consuming, as you can see by the fellas here uh, grinding the terrazzo down to expose the aggregate by these types of grinding stones called the galera. Uh, it wasn't until the mid 1920s when the invention of mechanical grinders allowed for a much quicker and faster application and its prevalent use across the country itself. Thank goodness, because it was the era of Art Deco, and we can't have a bit of Art Deco with a bit of terrazzo as well. You can find the application of terrazzo across all parts of the uh, United States, from incredibly well-known spaces such as the Guggenheim, all the way down to uh, our even our US post office and other federal buildings here in Spokane, for example, uh, as seen on the right-hand side. Uh, these applications were incredibly um, fortuitous for being not only durable, but also uh, incredibly easy to clean and maintain. For a little bit of our friends down south, um, Hoover is known for the use of terrazzo in its installation, uh, primarily on the interior areas of visitors areas, but also at the Monument Plaza by Oscar J. Hansen. The Monument Plaza, if you've ever been there, is this massive complex that shows the construction of the dam itself across the, the, the large procession time scale of, of the Earth's wobble. And if you go out there, you'll have a really amazing view and incredibly excellent examples of exterior terrazzo. It has been also recently been restored by our friends at Wischany Elsner. But at Grand Coulee itself, we have hundreds of thousands of square feet of, of flooring that need to be complete. Um, here on the examples of the unfinished well, finished to, to, to the generators, but unfinished for the actual flooring itself of, of left of the West Powerhouse at Grand Coulee Dam. So what do they do? And how do you take an old process that has been around for centuries and apply it at a massive and grand scale? Like all good uh, American processes, industrialization helps to move that along. And the industrialization of that process goes and allows us to take all of the aggregate, all of the marble chips, bring them all into a site and begin to use the tradespeople that have that are on site. That could include um, masonry folk, uh, other bricklayers and other components of, of masons that are around to help in the installation of this process. The mixing follows by an underlayment and then the marking of the of the metal strips themselves to provide that pattern. Then the mix of the terrazzo itself is poured into the into the area and then rolled and then finally polished and ground and polished. So you end up with a remarkable finish and an incredibly uh, uniform finish made from the tiny, tiny pieces of the aggregate and marble. The color scheme uh, varies across the different parts of the powerhouses and across the project itself, but here at, uh, at Cooley, the, the one in the left powerhouse is this deep uh, vermilion that almost matches the color of the 
uh, generators themselves and stands out against with these white uh, edging points. There you can see it between the two. Along with this broad and incredibly uh, uh, uniform application of the terrazzo across massive areas of the powerhouses and controller bays and in both, both powerhouses themselves, we have two incredibly beautiful pictorial representations. This rep pictorial representation is a plan view of the wicket gates and the Francis turbine uh, along with the central section of the shaft and the controlled uh, O-ring that moves and opens and closes the wicket gates themselves. The, the construction of this was much more uh, artisanal and required a much more uh, um, creative hand at it. So you can see here in, in the cross section of what that uh, plan view is trying to show. First, the, after the layout of the whole diagram was created at full scale. This is approximately 24 feet in diameter. That layout was then uh, edged with the pieces of zinc alloy to create the actual final form. Those components were then transferred over to the, to the area in the left powerhouse that was then slowly and meticulously mixed with the, with the terrazzo and added bit by bit to the particular areas of different colors. It's almost as if it was a large scale 3D version of a paint by, by number uh, system. Interestingly, uh, they also experimented with a, a sprinkling technique that allowed for a three dimensional uh, finishing that when you have a look at it, um, if it's available to be seen, it uh, gives the effect of three dimensions as well as depth across the entire um, design and pictorial form. It's an incredibly uh, beautiful and it's a unique example of terrazzo work, not only here at Grand Coulee, but also across the, the federal government for its complexity and its unique uh, technique and form. Also, we have a much smaller example of, of a typical generating unit that is in one of the prior uh, visitor center spaces uh, within the left powerhouse that currently is unfortunately being is covered and used by by as offices and covered by some tables. Um, but as you can see in a very similar way, the form and shape of this terrazzo is used and and displayed. A lot of the terrazzo Brett came from all parts of the country. Uh, marble from Maryland, from Texas, Virginia, Colorado, Tennessee, and was all brought up to the Odair transfer station just south of here near Cooley City. And this really represents the way that the style and form of these um, of Cooley uh, affected and impacted across the whole country itself. Today, over time, we see a variety of installations, not only in the powerhouses, but also at the PGP or the Keys uh, pump generating plant and the various other components and visitor facilities. Can't be, can't have a coolie talk without uh, discussing the third power plant or the Nathaniel Nat Washington power plant. Here's an original uh, sketch by uh, Marcel Brewer of what he envisioned that space to be like. And we have sections of five by three and a half foot uh, blocks or squares or rectangles covering the entire uh, length and breadth of that power plant itself. In this instance, in, in the early 80s and late 70s, the desire to, to recreate that terrazzo feel um, followed similar to the original powerhouses, uh, but in a much simplified effect. There aren't as many pictorial designs, um, but there are a lot of uses of its uh, precast form along the edges of the, of the uh, generators themselves. Today, it is a vast and incredibly prevalent uh, material that is found pretty much anywhere you go that is not only a public facility, but also in areas of heavy traffic. Uh, so you will find it uh, not only across the whole length of the of the main floor of the of the third power plant, but also along control bay units in the entry of the lobby, as well as the lobbies of the elevators and other areas across the project itself. 
It's conservation today um, is is thankfully a lot of it is thanks due to our cleaning staff who have maintained it and kept it um, to a good polish and sheen and therefore because of its long life and its ease of maintenance it has maintained its luster throughout the last uh, 70 years of, of existence. Our predecessors also were uh, incredibly uh, forthcoming with thinking about how to be able to repair components. So throughout various parts of the powerhouse hidden away are giant barrels filled with remnant aggregate that uh, allow us to hopefully repair sections that are damaged. Unfortunately, there are some damages throughout different parts of the facility, uh, but we are in the process of being able to to provide a conservation efforts to hopefully be able to rehabilitate and preserve this unique example of architectural history. Looking ahead, like I said, we'd like to really develop treatments to restore those damaged areas, to rehabilitate and primarily to preserve this unique architectural um, material, as well as assessing key features and components that could be connected not only to our current facility here at Grand Coulee, but to the broader Bureau of Reclamation's uh, architectural legacy and maintaining ongoing awareness and an appreciation for this uh, unknown, almost uh, lost to the eye uh, bit of material finishes. So the next time that you are walking along Hollywood and Vine or at an airport terminal, or even in your own project itself, be it at the dam or any other irrigation facility, have a look down and hopefully you may be walking upon a little bit of our own architectural history. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. That was great. For our final presenter, we are excited to have with us Guy Mora the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and History Archaeology Program Manager for the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. Guy received his BA in Anthropology from the University of Maine at Orono in 1977. A year later, he came west to work on the Chief Joseph Dam Cultural Resources Project as a field archaeologist. Since that time, he has continued to work with or for the Colville Confederated Tribes on numerous projects until coming on full time at his present position. Today, Guy will share with us the tribe's perspective on the history of the dam through their efforts to locate, identify, record, and manage cultural resources within and around Franklin D. Roosevelt Lake. Guy, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, folks. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, for the introduction. And as you mentioned in the very beginning of the presentation, there is a large volume of literature and a lot of information available about the adverse impacts of the building of Grand Coulee Dam to the Native American communities, particularly with the loss of the salmon runs to the upper Columbia River and then the erosion that has occurred that has destroyed a lot of archaeological sites. And this is not that story. This, this is the story of a successful partnership with the federal agencies and the tribe to try to protect those resources. And um, so I will begin. The foundation for the work that we do is based on the National Historic Preservation Act which has a section um, that protects cultural resources when there are federal funding, when there's federal funding involved. And the regulations that control that are under 36 CFR 800, and it outlines how you do and what the process for identifying, evaluating, and managing historic properties is conducted. So historic properties are archaeological sites, and most people understand what those are. 
standing structures like the dam itself, and then there are traditional cultural properties or places that are of traditional or religious cultural significance to the tribes. The types of um, traditional cultural properties there are are numerous, but they include places with Indian names, legendary locations like Steamboat Rock up in the upper left, or the Owl Sisters in the upper right, and it includes things like plants and other resources for subsistence, uh, and that is a flowering bitterroot in the lower left, and then places of origin stories and legends like um, the Shasta and Pinnacles, which you can see here in the lower right. So there's a wide variety of those. Uh, this is an image of us working with the elders to gather plant and other traditional information. And again, we record that information, we gather the oral histories, and we store those oral histories, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. And we do that by developing a database just like we would with any other data sets. And in this uh, image of the oral history database, you can see it's the standard uh, set of fields that explain who was interviewed and when, and uh, if we have transcribed it yet or not, the project areas involved, and the tribes that are that are included in that. So when we outlined the process, we said that the first thing you have to do is identification. So in this next slide that sh shows you what to look for, this is an example of one of the items that is commonly found in the Columbia Plateau, which is the remnants of semi subterranean houses. Um, in this image, you can see uh, somebody has recreated what a semi-subterranean house would look like and how it functioned. And once these are abandoned and the, and the framework deteriorates or is taken down, you are simply left with depressions in the ground. So archaeologists refer to those as house pits. And in the next image, you can see a LIDAR uh, reflection of one of these house pits just north of the road. You can see something like a large dimple. And then if you look down along the shoreline, you can also see a series of other dimples and mounds and things like that that tell us that there are more of these house pit locations and sites out there. And while um, there are a number of these types of sites, almost 2,000 archaeological sites in the Grand Coulee Dam project area. Uh, a lot of these images are representative of that work and not specific to Grand Coulee. The next image shows what the actual drawing of that landscape looks like, and you can see a series of circles down along the edge of the river says House Pit, HP, uh, and then the big one, which is across which is, is across the road. It's just showing how this ends up looking when we're out in the field and documenting these materials. So the next slide shows how we begin to document these things, which is through site survey. And people literally just walk transects or, or walk shorelines in a systematic fashion and record any indication of an archeological site that they can find. Uh, we also monitor for sites where burials have eroded from the banks in the past to make sure that we either stabilize those banks or know that there are no other individuals eroding out. And this is a function that we do in Grand Coulee under contract with reclamation directly, and it is a very significant aspect of the the tribe's concerns about cultural resources is monitoring for these sites. And then the next slide shows an image of people 
who are out there doing monitoring during drawdown, and this is a good example. You can clearly see where the water typically is. And uh, Grand Coulee, which is a storage reservoir, can draft 100 feet, and then typically every year, though, it goes down 40 to 60 feet vertically, which in a 150 six mile long reservoir makes for a lot of horizontal exposure as you can well imagine. And as you monitor these drawdowns, you can see where materials have eroded out of the banks. And in this image, the rocks in the center are two pestles and they're sitting amongst, amongst some broken and complete grinding stones. So the pestles would have been used to powder any number of things. You could either mash down root crops or you could powder seeds or you could dry, dry and pound and preserve river mussels. Um, and you could even do it with dried meat. So after you've identified these sites, you have to figure out if they are quote unquote significant or not. And in this next image, you can see two tribal members who are doing archeological excavations. And here, after the dirt is removed from the ground, they put it in the screens and go through it and look for artifacts. And the next image shows us doing such an excavation while at the same time we are just ahead of the people who are doing bank stabilization and we have done some major bank stabilization projects in Grand Coulee and mostly to protect ancestral cemeteries, the tribe's ancestors. So how do we use some of this information? The next image shows where we have taken some of the oral history and repopulated uh, a photograph of the area with the traditional names. And this is information that we use for education and it's also a resource for the tribal members to understand their history in these areas. The next image shows a series of the types of artifacts we find. These are the stone tools that most people are familiar with. There are drills and projectile points and arrowheads and scrapers and materials like that. The next image shows what we refer to as groundstone tools. In some instances, that's uh, the pestles and malls that you can see at the lower left. Or in the center, there's a couple of images of malls. There's a large pounding stone. Uh, there are two silt stone abraders, one in the center left and one in the upper right. And there's also some notched, you can just see them, they look like notched pebbles. And those are actually uh, net weights. And then you can see in the center columns, in the upper right and lower left of the center columns are two actually very large rocks. And when I talked about the grinding stones, these are actually referred to as hopper mortar bases. And a person would simply place a basket like object with no bottom in it onto the stone and then put in whatever was going to be ground up and pounded by the pestles. And then after doing that for years, you actually can see that the central portions have a rounded, smooth area from the, from the grinding that went on. So after we have completed the uh, identification and evaluation of significance and gone out and done these collectings, things come back to the repository for archaeological collections and the Confederate tribes of the Colville Reservation maintain a federally approved repository here in Nespelum at the headquarters. And we house all of the 
or most of the artifacts that have ever been excavated from Grand Coulee. Uh, everything is curated under the appropriate regulations. And then we store, have them for long term storage and for educational purposes and scientific research. And they are stored in what on the left uh, are called space saver units. They're accordion like shells. And when you open them up, you can see on the right that they open them up to stacks and stacks and stacks of things that you can uh, put away in there or put the artifacts in and then store them. Um, and with the space saver units, you can actually uh, put in a lot of material. So how do we use these things for education and how does this represent the tribe's history? Because that is the ultimate goal of the tribe. We use the information from archaeological sites today and contemporary issues regarding forestry, fisheries, uh, tribal rights and things like that. So how does the tribe use this data to amass some concept of the continuity of time. So in this image, you can see a series of archaeological sites. Those are the gray lines and blobs in there. And there's a little symbol next to each one, and it explains what type of a site it is that we are looking at. And it has their archaeological numbers written next to them. And this is just one small portion of the Grand Coulee Dam project area. And we take that prehistoric site information and we overlay it with the named places. And you can already begin to see that many of the named places fall within or next to or adjacent to the archaeological sites. But there's a lot of named places that are further away from the river where maybe archaeological inventory hasn't been completed yet. So the tribe then looks to the historic information we have. And when these lands left the reserve, the tribal reserve system, um, the tribal members were allotted certain properties and they were allowed to take these properties where they wished and they almost always took them in places that were for significant for their history, for a resource, or because they protected places that were sacred to the tribe. And in this next image, you can see the overlay now of all of these uh, three sets of data. And it shows that people have been here for thousands of years, occupying relatively the same places, and that these places are known because they have names and those names are still recorded and documented. And that is how we show the tribe's continuity through time. And that is really a significant thing for the tribe to be able to establish their presence. The next slide shows some of the other ways we use this information. Uh, here we have a reclamation archaeologist who at the time worked for the Confederated Tribes of the Colorado Reservation, and he is leading a school tour and trying to explain to the students about uh, archaeological features that are out on the landform. And then the next slide depicts a series of the types of educational materials that the tribe produces. There are DVD presentations, there is a children's book. There's a book of legends. There's a place name document. And all of these educational products are available online and um, will be posted in your chat session segment on how to access both the Colville Confederated Tribes website and then more specifically these items. But I highly recommend that anybody who wants to visit www.callvilletribes.com can find out a host of information about the history, uh, the natural resources, fish and wildlife, etc. And the next slide shows that we also do other types of creative mitigation. 
for the loss of the resources, the ongoing loss of archaeological sites and traditional areas from the operation and maintenance of the dam. And one of them is to try to restore uh, places that are significant to the tribe and the community um, from one part of the project area came to the Caldwell Business Council and they had an old church and it was in horrible condition and the windows were broken out and it was full of pigeons and bats and things like that. And while it wasn't still used regularly for masses, it was used regularly for some of the high religious season occasions and for funerals and weddings and things like that. So they asked if we could try to fix it up and using mitigation funds provided through the FCR or Federal Columbia River Power System. Uh, Cultural Resources Group, we did. Next slide, you can see a really good job of fixing up the church. And if you go to the next slide, this is the old Scholaskin Church. This used to actually be at the mouth of Whitestone Creek uh, in the project area. That location is now several hundred feet underwater. Before the dam rose, they moved um, the old church up first to Keller, and then later they moved it here to the um, Preservation Agency grounds in Nespelum. And again, this was a significant building. And as you can see, it was fairly horribly deteriorated. Uh, and again, we used uh, funds for mitigation from losses to our sites to do a restoration on the building. And then the last thing is the protection of these um, ancient burial grounds that I've discussed. Um, individuals had been re had been eroding from this area since the turn of two centuries ago now, and um, the cemetery that was there needed to be protected. And again, through the funds provided. Reclamation uh, engineers produced a plan to protect this place in sight. And then if you look at the next slide, you can see that they are nearing completion of the Gabion basket construction and then the added on earth. And in the final slide here, you can see what it looks like after it has been fully stabilized. Uh, that cemetery is now protected. We take a very his holistic approach. We work in the Grand Coulee Dam area with Reclamation and Bonneville Power Administration in particular on the Columbia River Treaty, the Columbia River Initiative, the Columbia River Systems Operations, et cetera. We're gonna continue to work on land acquisition school curriculum and tribal languages through these programs. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Guy. At this, this time, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them with the question icon. Um, we just have a limited time for questions right now, so if you Go ahead and uh, submit those right away. We'll get those answered. Um, we've had a couple questions come in. Um, Ivan, um, a question was raised about the what's happened with the TP in at Grand Coulee. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about that or what you're aware of? All I am aware of is that it was being repaired. I don't know yet if it's going to be placed on top of the drive-in, and uh, but. Repair work was being done. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I think this is for for Ivan and George and Guy. If you have any information, is the Grand Coulee area is a really interesting um, geologic area and how it was formed and all that. I think it's that's it's almost it's an entire presentation by itself. I'm a little familiar with that. Um, 
but can you just get George? Are you able to just do like a thirty second overview of of how that area was formed? Uh, sure, uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I saw that that you know the area of Grand Coulee Dam is interestingly the the dam itself is not built in Grand Coulee, but it's uh, you could call it it is Coulee adjacent, um, and. Uh, the actual coulee itself was created over a series of catastrophic flooding from the from the uh, the river itself, and and the rivers was diverted many many times over a series of different floods that uh, carved out sections of the coulee itself and through the area of the scablands of central Washington. There is actually an interesting um, gathering happening. A, at the Dry Falls State Park Visitor Center, the lovely little modernist building right out on the side of 17, happening in late July, uh, which will explore all aspects Grand Coulee uh, from its natural history uh, as well as cultural history and its creation from up here at Columbia all the way down to the potholes down just south of Moses Lake. Thank you. I think the Park Service has done some stuff too on on some of the giant ice dams that were up in northern Idaho that mm -hmm. held back the water and then the catastrophic floods came down. So yeah, um, interesting uh, look at geological history is if, if you're interested in that. Um, I don't have any other questions. Um, uh, Ivan or George, do you want to talk a little bit if, if someone's up in north central Washington and want to come visit the dam, what 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 they can do or see when they're there? Well, there are so many things that can be seen, and, and, and one of them with that last subject is we have a Great Floods movie that's played in the theater at the Visitor Center that gives you a good start. And a great place to go for guides for the area is at the, at the bookstore at the Dry Falls Park. Thank you, and what, you have something, uh, an annual tradition uh, starting up again for the summer tomorrow night. Do you want to just mention that real quick? Tomorrow night we have our first show of the lasers shining the Grand Coulee Dam story across three quarters of a mile of the dam starting at 10 o'clock. The best place to view is in those wonderful, comfortable concrete seats along the Visitor Center parking lot. Thank you very much. Um, as Guy mentioned um, in the in the Q and A for this, we published the link to the Colville Tribes. If you want to learn more, uh, that link is there. And appreciate the uh, um, information going on. Um, I just got to note the note that the uh, light show begins on May twenty eighth. Is that is that correct? So. Ivan, I think you're muted there. Yes, yes, starts Saturday night. I was thinking this was Friday. Thank you. No problem. But uh, we shared the link to the Coville Tribes website to learn more about what they're doing and um, go there. That's uh, the link is available. So um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today on the final uh, history symposium. Um, I would like to thank our presenters today. Uh, I especially would like to thank uh, Guy Mora for taking the time out. Uh, Guy works for the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation and I found that quite interesting about what they're doing and, and working with reclamation um, around the, the project. It's really uh, interesting work and appreciate um, him joining and sharing that information with us today. Um, I would also like to to thank uh, Ivan and George for putting the presentations together. Both were really interesting and unique about the dam. Things that we typically don't get to see about the history of a dam, the kind of the formation of the city and how the workers lived and the this unique uh, terrazzo that was put into the facility. It kind of makes it kind of unique and um, kind of puts it in the time period back when it was built. Um, I'd also like to thank Erica Lopez of the Columbia Pacific Northwest Region for helping uh, organize all the presenters uh, we had today um, and Chelsea Kennedy for producing this event. And also like to thank my uh, partner in crime over the last 12 months, uh, Dr. Andrew Gahan, um, for working on uh, all these history symposiums and bouncing ideas off each other as we worked uh, for topics. Um, 
So I'd like to, to thank for that. Um, all these uh, presentations are available uh, through um, a Microsoft Stream. If you want to go back and see see those presentations, um, I've added a link the link to the channel with all those presentations um, in the the published uh, Q and A, so everyone can see those. If you missed one or like to go back and watch one, they're all available for for viewing. Um, once again, thank you everyone and everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, remember Reclamation's 120th anniversary is next month on June 17th, 2022. Thank you everyone. Have a good day.